The Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 16 A few minutes later, I step away, still clutching the medicine box in a death grip, and wipe my face with my wrists. Khadija sinks onto her stool. I fall into a chair and put the medicine box on the table again. For a few moments, neither of us says anything. Then, in spite of how tired and drained I feel, curiosity gets the better of me. So, I say, you're a city girl who ended up on a farm in the middle of nowhere working cacao with a bunch of boys from Mali. You're an Ivorian, but your name isn't Christian and you don't speak French. You make no sense at all. Actually, I do speak French, Khadija whispers unsteadily. I just happen to speak Bambara, too. My last name is Kablan, because my father is Ivorian and Christian, but my mother grew up in Bamako. I'm named after my Malian grandmother, which is why I have a Muslim first name. Growing up, my mama always spoke Bambara to me at home. It was our secret language. And yes, I'm a city girl. She goes on, looking at her small hands with their soft fingers that told me that anyway. Mama is a journalist in Abidjan. I grew up in the city, and I go to the international school there. I bet it's expensive, I think acidly, but I'm too tired to take another jab at her. I'm not exactly sure what Mama was working on, Khadija says, but she was putting together information for a big report. I'd catch her having whispered conversations on the phone, and she'd leave late at night and wouldn't tell me where she was going. What did your father say? I ask, trying to imagine a world where a woman could sneak out at night and that wouldn't be a problem. Khadija splays her soft fingers on the table, examining them. My father doesn't live with us. He lives in France. I stare, sure now that we don't live in anything near the same world. France? She may as well have said that. She may as well have said her father was living on the southern tip of the moon. Anyway, Khadija continues, it's Mama and me now, and I wanted to know what was going on. I would ask her again and again, but she wouldn't tell me. She still treats me like I'm Sadu's age. She would only say that what it was important, and that important people were involved, and that I was safer if I didn't know anything more. That was a lie. I'm surprised by her sudden bitterness. Her hands are buried in the material of her skirt, and her voice shakes when she goes on. Then the phone calls started. I know what phone calls are. The bosses had a mobile phone that they used every once in a while to talk to people who weren't there, and I've seen some of the pastors talking on two-way radios. But there must have been something different about those calls because Khadija's voice doesn't sound angry anymore. It sounds scared and she stopped twisting her arms in her skirt and is instead holding onto her arms as if she's cold. Who were they from, I ask. She looks at me and her eyes are glassy. I don't know, she says. Mama started getting phone calls on her mobile that frightened her. Her phone would ring and she would hang up as soon as she heard what the person on the other end of the line was saying. She never said a word, just hung up. And in the mornings, when she would listen to the messages she got overnight, she would hold the phone so tightly I thought the plastic would break and her lips would disappear. She was pressing them together so hard. I tried to listen to find out what they said, but she would always push me away, and, when, and then she would delete the messages right after. I thought that was the worst. But it wasn't? No. Then we started getting calls at the house. I pulled out of her story for a moment while I try to understand why one person would need two phones to call themselves when there's no one else to talk to? Ridiculous. Once I heard a man on the other end of the line, Khadija continues. When I said hello, he asked me what my name was. I can see that her hands are trembling. I wouldn't tell him. He laughed and told me to tell my mother that she should be more careful. You know what happens to people who ask questions, he said, and you know what happens to people who answer them. I frown, concerned. Did you tell anyone, I ask? Yes, but even so, Mama wouldn't tell me what she was doing. I said I was old enough to know, but she said age has nothing to do with it and kept working in secret. But I was really scared by then, Khadija goes on. We were getting phone calls every day. 
sometimes a couple times a day or in the middle of the night. And when we'd answer, there was just silence on the other end. I said, hello, hello, into the phone over and over again, and nobody said anything back, but I could hear them breathing. So I knew someone was there. Somehow, that was even more terrifying than when they were threatening us. I know what she means. I was quiet at the farm a lot because quiet can be very scary, and being scary got people to do things if I needed them to. The comparison makes me pause, and with a shudder, I wonder whether my quiet menace ever made the other boys feel as frightened as Khadijah felt with the man on the phone. I hope not. I don't really want to have anything in common with the men she's describing. Mama decided it was too dangerous to stay in the capital. We packed some bags and rented a little house in San Pedro, a port town. She promised we would only stay there a little while. She said there were only a few more things she needed to find out, and then we could be done with the whole project. Maybe we go to France, she said, and visit my father. That's when I knew she was really scared. Mama doesn't like to run away, and she always said we'd never go to France because it's too cold. France, I mumbled to myself, trying to picture it. I imagine a village like Daula, but with everyone shivering. I don't think I would like to go to France, Khadijah says, picking at the ribbon, her dress. I don't have very many friends in Abidjan, but it's the only place I've ever lived. Mama worked like crazy those last few days in San Pedro. She would be typing late into the night and was awake before dawn making whispered phone calls. She told me I'd be safe in the house with Stephanie and Sandrine, but I was never to go out alone. I sat there day after day with my school books, staring through my window at the garden wall. I didn't see very much of her. I wonder who Stephanie and Sandrin are. Cousins? Uncles and aunts? But I'm more worried by what she just said. Those last few days before what? I asked, hardly daring to breathe. I know what it's like to lose a parent. My mother died birthing Sedu, and I remember what it felt like to suddenly have the space she filled in the world be empty. Before I was kidnapped, says Khadijah, and then everything finally makes sense. The way she never fit in, her fiery determination to escape. She never looked for work here, never agreed to work for pay that wouldn't come, was never fooled into going willingly. She had been taken by force. That's why she was fighting so hard to get out. It all happened very quickly. One night, a little after Mama left for one of her secret meetings, a group of men broke into our house. They had disconnected the phone line and the electricity, but the power goes out all the time, and I didn't really think anything of it. They knocked out our guard. I tried to fight and run. I really did. Khadijah trails off, and I'm horrified to see that she, she's crying. Don't cry, I say. I hate seeing people cry. I'm sure you did. You're a fighter. I snort a bit of a laugh. And a runner. I'm sure you did all you could. Khadijah gives me a weary smile. It wasn't enough. There were a bunch of them, and they were bigger and stronger than me, and they were able to tie me up and gag me and put a bag over my head. She shudders. It was so dark with the cloth bag on my head. It used to be a grain sack or a rice sack or something, and it was full of little bits of grit that kept falling into my eyes and grinding against my face. But the worst part of it was that I had a gag in my mouth, and so I had to breathe through my nose, and I could see the bits of rice or whatever it was clogging the holes and filling my nose with dust, and it was so hard to breathe, she pauses. So hard to breathe, she whispers again. Then she shakes the memory off and continues. They threw me in a truck, and though I tried to scream and kick, it didn't do any good. Nobody could hear me through the gag, and kicking them just made them kick me. I finally lay quietly on the floor because I was scared I was going to suffocate. I can barely imagine what that would feel like. I shudder. We drove forever and the roads got worse and worse, she goes on. I was tossed around on the floor and I kept hitting my head because my hands were tied and I couldn't brace myself. A while later, we stopped and I was dragged out and handed off to new men. They tied me, sitting up this time in a van, and took the bag off my head. They left the gag in, though, so I still couldn't scream for help. But I was so grateful to them for taking off the bag so I could breathe again that I didn't even struggle. She pauses and looks at me. 
I hated myself for feeling grateful to them, she says. I think over all the times I was grateful for the small mercies of life on the farm. How deep inside I knew that food or basic medical care or not getting beaten shouldn't be a cause for celebration, but I felt that way anyway. How I tried not to think about it because if I did, I would have hated myself too. I understand, I say. I thought you would. Khadija pushes her hands over her face and smooths her braids. She sits up a little straighter. Anyway, they handed me off once more, this time to a man in a truck, and that last time they took off the gag. I screamed until I was hoarse, but I was tied up in the back seat and the driver was sitting in front and couldn't care less. He turned the radio up loud and kept driving. We went deeper and deeper into the bush, away from everything I knew, and I kept wondering where he was taking me, whether he would kill me, and then all of a sudden we stop. And he comes around and pulls me out of the truck onto the ground, and I'm standing in a clearing in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by boys and this tall man, Musa. And the man who had brought me is telling him that I have to be kept here because I'm a guarantee that someone will keep their mouth shut back in the city. And he hands Musa money, and then he turns the truck around and leaves. I remember that day. I remember her bruised face and her ferocious eyes. I remember looking away. I do so again. And you know the rest, I guess, she says softly. I realized that I had been taken so they could frighten my mama into being quiet, into not publishing whatever it was that she was working on, and that I decided that I wouldn't let them use me that way, that I would escape and get home. She looks at me again and her eyes are bleak. I thought I was valuable enough that they wouldn't hurt me. I was wrong about that too. I'm sorry, I say. My big hands are fists in my lap. The muscles of my forearms, forearms are standing out in ridges, but all my strength hasn't been enough to help anyone when they really needed me. When I apologize to her, my voice is a broken thing. I'm so sorry. For what? She asks. I don't meet her eyes. I didn't stop them. I was right there and I didn't do anything. I remember my hope, right as the men came back, that they might be too busy punishing her to come find me, and I feel so sickened with myself that I wish I could die. I feel a city soft hand on my arm. There was nothing you could have done, Amadou. Tears hit my hands and I glance up at her. Her eyes are dry. I could have tried, I whisper. You, you were there afterward, she says finally. You've been there for me ever since. I shake my head, not quite able to let the guilt go, but still it feels good to be forgiven. I loosen my fist and put one of my hands over hers and squeeze it. You've helped me too, I say, remembering her pulling Musa off me so that Sado and I could get away. And you did escape, I remind her, after what, only a week? I do the math in my head, six days. They were only able to keep you there for six days. They kept me for two years. You're pretty amazing for a soft little city girl. This gets a small smile out of her. Then her smile fades. My mama must be so worried, Amadou. I have to get home and let her know that I'm all right. I want you to come with me. I feel ripped in half. But Sadu and I need to go to Mali, I whisper. The closer we go to the coast with you, the more likely it is that we won't get home. I have to get Sadu home. I let out a breath. You should definitely hitch a ride in Omar's truck. Have him take you to Daula and then go south and be with your mother. But Sadu and I need to go north. She looks small and lost. But what do I do if those other men find me? What if I can't make it home? What if Mama never knows what happened to me? I'm scared, Amadou. I'm surprised by how closely her fears mirror my own. I too am worried about the bosses catching us. I, too, am worried about never making it home. I, too, don't want to die invisible. I look over to where Sedu's breath is coming rapid and shallow, then down at where our hands are overlapping. My gut twists. I don't know what to do, I whisper without meaning to. Khadija puts her other hand on top of mine. Come with me, she says. In the city, we have access to a good doctor and good medicines. Those moldy pills are so old that I don't even know if they're really helping Sedu at all. 
but my mother can call a real doctor, and he can see that Sadu's all right. And then I'll make sure that we find a way to get you home to Molly safely. Mother has connections with reporters and organizations and all kinds of people. Let's stay together, please, Amadou. We'll find a way to get you home once we've made Sadu better. I promise. I promise. It echoes in my head, and without even wanting to do so, I find myself nodding. Okay, I whisper, and it's done. We're going south.